clearly this is not about the sanctity of marriage, but it is about discrimination, it is about limitation. Uh, family policy belongs in our shared cultural discussion and work, not in the Constitution. And if we're to offer this, let's just make it clear that we are limiting. No, this is, this is not a simple thing. This is not a simple matter. We are creating a problem for millions of people, for thousands of couples who want to get married, to protect their children, to have their homes, to pass these homes on to their children, to make decisions for their children. That's what we are going to be denying, all of these individuals, with this amendment. And this seat, this seat that we hold, it's not my seat. It's not your seat, Senator Latz, or your Senator Inger Ingerbritsen. This is the people's seat. And they put us here to make some of these decisions. And they also put us here, even maybe not always at their best interest, but to think about what we do and to not discriminate. To expect that we will rise above that, even if sometimes they can't. They expect us to rise above some of this petty stuff and to get on with the business of government. And they can bring their views here and they can bring religious views here, but how many people have ever done that and really expected it to get into the Constitution? You're gonna go back into your communities and you're gonna to have to think about what you do here. And are you gonna be proud of the fact that you voted to, to put discrimination in the Constitution? Uh, we ought to be afraid of the tyranny of the majority. Now that's not to say that the majority shouldn't rule. The majority does rule, but as Senator Marty indicated, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights in particular in both the Minnesota and the United States Constitutions are there specifically to protect the rights of the minorities, to protect the rights of those who don't have the majority views, but who have rights and have beliefs that we believe as, as a people are so fundamental that even if we disagree vehemently with what they think and what they want to do and what they have to say, if it doesn't have a physical threat to me, then they can do it, and they can say it. You'd think that as a Republican, I'd be on the other side of this issue. But I'm here today because I don't believe that equal rights for same-sex couples, or anyone, is a partisan issue. In fact, I'm not in this chair today because of a relationship I've had with a gay brother, sister, friend, or relative. To be honest, before I became a part of this movement three years ago, I didn't even have a gay friend. Instead, I'm driven by something else, an ideology, one encouraged by my peers, that tells me that this is not the direction our state or our nation should be headed. In fact, amongst my generation, there's no doubt that equal rights for all Minnesotans is absolutely necessary for the good of our state. In other words, it should not be the focus of efforts to achieve political gain or debate. The need for equality and the full acceptance of GLBT people is something Minnesota's next generation of leaders has already embraced. Public opinion is moving quickly towards full equality and passage of this bill would lead us astray. How much of homosexuality is nature versus nurture? Is this something that you learn or acquire or is this something that you're born with? Is this just another lifestyle choice like skateboarding or gardening? Or is this something that's innate with a human being? And I think the scientific evidence shows more and more every day that sexuality and sexual orientation are innate and something that people are born with. And I would ask everyone on this committee, not today, not tomorrow, not next week, not even this year, but at a moment uh, when you can be alone with your own thoughts, to ask yourself if that's true, if it's even possibly true, what does that mean to the moral force of your argument? Just ask yourself, not now in the glare of the Capitol and caucuses and interest groups, but ask yourself if it's true that sexual orientation is innate, God-given, then what does it mean to the moral force of your argument? And I guess the, to put it in the vernacular, what I would ask is, how many more gay people does God have to create before we ask ourselves whether or not God actually wants them around?
we vote yes tonight and advance this question to the ballot, we're seeing just now in the Capitol this week the divisions that we're going to cause across Minnesota, in our communities, within our families, among our neighbors. I'm distributing a copy of my wedding invitation alongside of a wedding invitation of two wonderful women, Jen and Jane, they're friends of ours. Nobody voted on our marriage. Why should anybody except for them have any right to vote on their marriage? Anybody. Senator Limmer, you want the public to vote. Senator Gazelka, you say, let the people vote. Why? Why are Jen and Jane not able to make up their own decision? Well, they can make their own decision, but we can't marry them. Well, we're concerned about kids. They have a two-year-old daughter. You know, they're actually very wonderful parents, better than a whole lot of other parents I've seen, and that kid is well-loved. Now, how does it help them? How does it help them to put in the Constitution that little girl's parents can't get married? Because we think there's something wrong with it. Is there anything in Jen and Jane's marriage, their family, that hurts anybody else? Anybody? Tell me what it is. You get silence, no answer. And you don't have to agree with my religious beliefs. I don't ask you to. I ask you to say, why should yours be written into the Constitution instead of mine? Neither of them should be. Government's job is to treat everybody equally. Government's job is to not favor religious, some beliefs over others. I would asked uh, if we're going to use the Bible and Leviticus specifically to legislate, uh, what other biblical laws should we in fact be invoking? Uh, one that comes personally to mind is Leviticus 25, 44 through 46. Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. Uh, from them you may buy slaves, you may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of their clans born in your country uh, and can make them slaves for life. I'm not comfortable with using Leviticus as the basis for my law. In Lovey versus Virginia, they made the note that there is a right to marriage. And I know some in the committee said they didn't think there was any right to, to marriage, but in fact the U.S. Supreme Court has in fact recognized the right to marriage. Uh, in a unanimous decision, the court wrote, marriage is one of the basic civil rights of man. With you. Sometimes, you know, we sit here, 134 of us in this chamber, and 67 of us in another chamber, and we sit and impact people's lives every day we are here. And remember, sometimes we don't know the impact that we make on them because we haven't walked in their shoes. 31 states have uh, made this change to their uh, constitution. Iowa, by decision of the Supreme Court, um, allow people to get married. What, uh, what problems have been created in Iowa as a result of what happened in the last year or so? Uh, what, what problem is there? Uh, Senator Limmer uh, made a statement about how uh, marriage is so fundamentally a part of, of who we are in our society. Here's my real question. Here's a picture of myself and my husband Richard on the floor of the Senate on the first day of session. What's, what's so different about us? What's so dangerous and what's such, what's such a problem? What family is this helping? Not a single family in Minnesota is helped by this effort. But I'll tell you what, a lot of families are hurt. Uh, the other couple that got married 48 years ago was Barack Obama's parents. A black man and a white woman. And at that time, in 26 states, it was illegal for a black and a white to marry. And that's what the people of those 26 states decided that was proper. The Gottwald Bill will take us back 48 years. And folks, I grew up in the 60s, obviously. And we've come a long way, baby.
and I don't want to go back 48 years. this was five, six years ago, I probably would have voted yes, because I didn't think about it. I just thought about my family. I thought about what affects my wife and my kids and nothing else. Everything changed. I went to Iraq. I was in an incident. I nearly died. I remember laying there, looking down and seeing my legs mangled and pretty much guaranteeing that I was a done, I was a done deal. I thought that's where my life was going to end. And I remember thinking of my wife and my kids. That's what crossed my mind. And that's what kept me fighting, the love I have for them. It woke me up. It changed me. And as bad as that day sucked, I've learned a lot from it. And it's changed who I am for the better. Because of that, it's made me think about this issue and say, you know what? What would I do without my wife? She makes me happy. Life is hard. We're in it really tough time in our history really tough time happiness is so so hard to find for people so they find it they find someone that makes them happy and we want to take that person away we want to say well no you can be together you can be together you can love that person but you can't marry them you can't marry them that's wrong that's wrong and i disagree with it this amendment doesn't represent what i went to fight for. This doesn't represent that. Hear that out there? That's the America I fought for. And I'm proud of that. A little bit earlier, I had this passed around. It's a photo of a gentleman named Corporal Andrew Wilford. He gave his life in Afghanistan on, this, on February 27th of this year. He hit an improvised explosive device while keeping us safe, protecting our freedoms, giving us the right to have this debate tonight. He was gay. He was gay. I don't know about you guys, but I cannot look at this family and look at this picture and say, you know what, Corporal, you were good enough to fight for your country and give your life, but you were not good enough to marry the person you love. I can't do that. I cannot do that. And I won't do that. Please vote no. Stand up for freedom. Thank you. And I appreciate you listening to me. There being 70 ayes and 62 nays, the bill is passed, its title is agreed to.
We are going to roll out of this capital and we are going to roll across the plains and prairies of Minnesota and we are going to show Minnesota who we are. We are a strong people. We are a loving people. We are part of every family, every neighborhood, every workplace, every church, every synagogue. We are in every corner and we love our families and our families are strong. And Minnesota will know that in the next 18 months. And you know what? 31 states, there's not going to be 32. It stops here. I want to say we are a gentle, angry people tonight. And we will do real positive work with both our gentleness and our angriness. And I believe that we can win this. We can win this campaign. We have to work very hard and support each other, support our families. Love will just prevail. It's the passage of the marriage amendment on the Senate floor final vote was 38 to 27 and it did enjoy bipartisan support uh, having one DFLer uh, join Republicans in the passage of the marriage amendment. Uh, as some of you know the marriage amendment uh, is a proposal to give to the people uh, in the 2012 election uh, allowing them to make a policy direction and giving us advice and direction on how we write a particular area of law and that's the definition of marriage to be defined solely as one man and one woman and then that statement would be uh, provided in our Constitution. This is a time when the state has to come together and work hard to overcome its challenges. We've certainly taken a punch to the gut but we're still standing and we're going to come together and we're going to fight and we're going to show that our families are rooted in love and commitment and responsibility. And we're going to talk about that with the state of Minnesota. We're going to have that conversation that the other side claims they're going to have. They're, of course, going to have a divisive and angry and bitter campaign fueled by millions of dollars. But we're going to have that conversation with Minnesota and show ourselves to <clears throat> Minnesota in ways that they've never seen us. Families who are part of every community working hard to support each other and to support our larger community. And I know that we're going to defeat this amendment, this anti-marriage amendment. I have vetoed and am returning Chapter 88, Senate File 1308, an act proposing an amendment to the Minnesota Constitution, adding a section to Article 13, recognizing marriage as only a union between one man and one woman. Although I do not have the power to prevent this divisive and destructive constitutional amendment from appearing on the Minnesota ballot in November 2012, the legislature sent it to me in the form of a bill. Thus, symbolic as it may be, I'm exercising my legal responsibility to either sign it or veto it. Without question, I am vetoing it, and I urge Minnesotans to reject this mean-spirited, divisive, un-Minnesotan, and un-American amendment. One of the founding principles of our country embodied in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution is the separation of church and state. Therefore, the religious definition of marriage should be the province of each established religion without interference from government. However, the civil or legal realm of marriage is the province of government, and it must conform to the protections and guarantees afforded every American citizen under our Constitution. The 14th Amendment of the Constitution says, quote, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So literally minutes after, minutes after that decision by the legislature to thrust us into this conversation, a bunch of different organizations came together. In Minnesota, there's two statewide lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender organizations. They're called Outfront Minnesota and Project 515. Those two statewide organizations came together and said, we're going to have one focused effort. And they reached out to the national organizations like the Human Rights Campaign, the Task Force, Freedom to Marry, and Family Equality Council. And so those six organizations banded, banded together 
to form the coalition that is known as Minnesotans United for All Families. It's neck and neck. It's, um, it's a dead heat. We've actually lost the same amendment in 30 other states. And right now, we're 1% down in the polls. We've had races that have come down to just a couple hundred votes. Um, and so the impacts of you know a lot of other people could really mean the difference between us winning and losing. We just need more volunteers. We need more people coming in and making calls, talking to people, having conversations. The first time I was on the phones, I moved my first voter. The experience of moving an 83-year-old woman um, and see like her actually change her mind, it's incredible. So much energy at the office every single day. It's crazy, it's energetic, it's fun. Everyone fills out hearts when they come into our office and just seeing it on the wall, um, everyone's reasoning for wanting to come in is just really powerful. Volunteers are bringing us food every single day because they care about us and they care about defeating this thing too. Minnesota nice is real. I know a lot of people don't think about it, um, but we're, we're staying strong here in the Midwest. Minnesotans really care about uh, people in general. We have a very uh, forward-thinking um, state and that's why I think we got a chance. There are new people that come into our office every day and hearing their stories and, and hearing you know just how hurtful this is to the entire state um, is what keeps me coming in. It's the largest campaign in Minnesota history um, and if we can't win this one I don't know what else we could have done. In 2012 in Minnesota, we need you all to help us. We need you to come out as a no voter.
Uh, we know that based on the strategy that our opponents have used in 30 other states that they're going to go up on air in this, in this state for the last three weeks, uh, airing some of the most divisive and hurtful ads, um, really saying that some, val some families deserve to be valued while others don't. Marriage as the union of a man and a woman has served society well for thousands of years. Marriage is more than a commitment between two loving people. It was made by God for the creation and care of the next generation. Marriage is an issue that should be decided by the people. Voting yes secures traditional marriage in the Constitution and ensures only voters can determine the definition of marriage in the future. Please vote yes on the Marriage Protection Amendment. There have been a lot of broken promises elsewhere about gay marriage, like it won't affect anyone else, even as small businesses are fined, charities closed, and people fired. Or it won't impact religious liberty, even as pastors are punished and harassed, churches sued, and believers targeted. Or it won't be taught to young children in public schools, even though it was in Massachusetts and Canada. Don't trust broken promises. Vote yes on Amendment 1 to protect marriage. We know from statistics that children do best. And study after study tells us that children do best with biological mom and biological dad in a non-confrontational family environment. And General Mills has decided that they're going to support a cause that is not family friendly. Yes, it's not against gay people. We're just saying we don't want them to change the definition of marriage. mom and a dad. Moms and dads are not interchangeable. Kids, Kids need a mom and a dad. We just had our 13th anniversary. <laughs> 13 years and three kids. It's a commitment to forever. Marriage is really important to me. I didn't really think a lot about same-sex marriage. We had a, um, a gay couple live in our neighborhood. They had adopted a little son, and they, they were the most wonderful neighbors. It taught all of us in our little suburban world. We did have some good discussions. In our daughter's world, her normal is so much different than ours. It didn't phase her at all. It's okay to take a second look. And when you do, vote no. Used to be there wasn't even this discussion. Marriage was a man and a woman. But times change, and I've thought about it more. My marriage is the most important thing in my life. Who am I to deny that to anybody, gay or straight? I'm not going to limit a basic freedom just because I'm uncomfortable, and I'm not going to put it in our state constitution. Our constitution should protect our freedoms, not take them away. I'm voting no. And so I want you to go to bed tonight. I want you to be very, very proud of the result we have.
here today. This conversation does not end tonight. It's only just a Let's hear it, Minnesota! Love is bigger than government, and Minnesota voted no to prove it. Way to go. You know, 18 months ago, when Minnesota was thrust into this conversation, it could have gone two very different ways. One direction is something we've seen in way too many states across this country, and that is where communities, neighborhoods, cities, and states get ripped apart by a hurtful and very divisive conversation. But 18 months ago, when we were thrust into this conversation, we chose as Minnesotans to do something different, to reach out and talk to our neighbor, to be in conversation with one another, and to make sure everybody knows why marriage matters and why Minnesota must and did vote no. The efforts of the last 18 months have been just absolutely astounding. More than 700 coalition partners came together representing all walks of life in Minnesota. We have political leaders from all major political parties working together. They agree on nothing else, except for this one thing, and that is Minnesota should vote no. We have, we had business leaders and businesses come and join our coalition. We had labor organizations and labor leaders leading the way. We, we, <laughs> we had community leaders and nonprofits we had the faith community, not in spite of their faith, but because of their faith. But most importantly, we had an incredible number of Minnesotans who stepped up and personally invested their time and energy, more than 28,000 volunteers on this campaign to make it the largest grassroots campaign in Minnesota history. The credit for this victory last night, or early morning, I guess, goes to those volunteers. In the last week alone, this campaign was able to dial more than 900,000 phone numbers. We knocked on more than 400,000 doors. And because of all your energy, we turned out more than 1.3 million no votes to deliver victory and beat this amendment. We shape our future together. We embrace a politics of inclusion and justice for all. And we believe in the wisdom and dignity of people. What we have built over the course of these many, many months on the campaign trail is new capacity in pursuit of something great and something greater than ourselves. And it will endure long, long after Election Day. So tonight, we close the chapter on no, and we open the chapter to yes. We must acknowledge that defeating this amendment did not change the 515 laws that treat members of the LGBT community differently than their straight married partners. Project 515 and Out Front are dedicated to keeping this momentum going until we have achieved equal rights, responsibilities, and considerations for same-sex couples and their families. And we will keep working until all families are treated with the respect they deserve, until the love all couples share is respected. When we go back into the state legislature, we are going to be moving forward. We're going to be moving forward. How we do that is something that I hope we will have more conversation about. But we I get mean, to roll out of this campaign and we get to roll out of this rally and have that conversation and get to work because guess what? Minnesotans decided not to shut the door yesterday. They decided not to stop the conversation. Love, 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 love. love.
overwhelming numbers, the unifying and clarifying power of love. And if not now, when? When is it? Over 2,000 gathered in the Capitol Rotunda Valentine's Day to voice their support for a bill aimed at legalizing same-sex marriage in Minnesota in 2013. It is very important to me because someday I want to get married to a girl for my life. The organized rally Freedom to Marry Day was spearheaded by the Twin City-based nonprofits Outfront Minnesota and Minnesotans United for All Families. Minnesotans to get back involved and really connect with their legislators and really talk about what love means, what, what being a Minnesotan is about, and that Minnesotans really do value the freedom to marry for all families, and that's what we need, and it's really simple, and luckily we're really, we're really, really seasoned at it because we were working on the amendment, and we defeated that. And we just have to keep the momentum going. And, you know, I really think that when you talk about love, legislators get really excited. You get to talk about what family means. And I just think that our legislators really need to hear from enough people from the district so they know that this is the right thing to do and that the time is now. The bill is currently being authored and will be introduced into the House and Senate for committee hearings in the coming weeks. If approved, the bill will then move to the floor where it will need majorities and both houses in order to pass. If passed into law, the bill would go into effect August 1st. A recent public poll found that 47% of Minnesotans are in favor of same-sex marriage equality, while 45% oppose it. And while it seems like majority of Minnesotans are supportive of same-sex marriage equality, many legislators, Democrats, and Republicans alike are hesitant to tackle such a controversial subject. And while some at the Capitol are unsure of where they stand on the issue, Governor Mark Dayton has explicitly stated that if the bill were to reach his desk, that he would sign it into law. For KSSU, I'm Derek Schultz. It is now our generation's task to carry on what those pioneers began. For our journey is not complete until our wives, our mothers and daughters can earn a living equal to their efforts. Our journey is not complete until our gay brothers and sisters are treated like anyone else under the law. For if we are truly created equal, then surely the love we commit to one another must be equal as well. You know, when government starts to tell us who can love and what is good love, um, whether it's a government or a government built on a certain religion, um, I, I do have a problem with that. LGBT Americans are our colleagues, our teachers, our soldiers, our friends, our loved ones. And they are full and equal citizens and deserve the rights of citizenship. That includes marriage. Any accurate reading of the Bible should make it clear that gay rights goes against the plain truth of the Word of God. As one preacher warns, man and overstepping the boundary lines God has drawn by making special rights for gays and lesbians, has taken another step in the direction of inviting the judgment of God upon our land. It's not that we don't care about homosexuals, but it's that our rights will be taken away. And unchristian views will be forced on us and our children, for we'll be forced to go against our personal morals. Outside government agents are endeavoring to disturb God's established order. It is not in line with the Bible. Do not let people lead you astray. You produce destruction and trouble, and our city is in the greatest danger that it has ever been in in its history. The reason is that we have gotten away from the Bible of our forefathers. You see, the right of segregation, I'm sorry, hold on. The right of segregation is clearly established by the Holy Scriptures, both by precept and example. One minute. I'm sorry, I brought the wrong notes with me this evening. Uh, I've borrowed my argument from the wrong century. 
Uh, it turns out what I've been reading to you this whole time are direct quotes from white preachers from the 1950s and the 1960s, all in support of racial segregation. All I have done is simply take out the phrase racial integration and substituted it with the phrase gay rights. Same-sex marriage will be front and center at the Supreme Court this week. Justices will hear arguments in two major cases. Jan Crawford is at the court in Washington this morning. Jan, good morning to you. Well, good morning, Gail, and good morning, Charlie. These legal issues in these cases have really been brewing for years, and everybody knew it was just a matter of time before the Supreme Court was going to get involved. And now, in two days this week, the justices will hear these historic arguments that could define how states and the federal government define marriage. The arguments coincide with a dramatic shift in public opinion. Recent polls show 58% now approve of gay marriage. Support shoots up to 81% with people under 30. Nine states and the District of Columbia now allow it. Are you listening? Bless God and bless the gays. Um, well, today uh, we're here to announce that we'll be introducing a bill. Um, it'll be introduced in both the f uh, on the floor of the House and on the floor of the Senate tomorrow. And what that bill would accomplish, it would simply allow uh, folks who so desire, who have demonstrated a lifetime of love and commitment uh, to get married, uh, even if they're same-sex couple. This is a day to be very, very proud to be a Minnesotan because Minnesotans have rallied around this unifying, this clarifying discussion about the power of love in our lives. And we're doing this because freedom is for everyone, democracy is for everyone. And freedom and love and democracy are all strengthened by taking this step. Uh, introduction of the, uh, uh, the bill to legalize gay marriage in uh, the state of Minnesota this morning. Uh, or rather the uh, announcement of the uh, pending introduction of the bill comes as no surprise to us. It's exactly what we warned would happen throughout the, the uh, last year and a half without a constitutional amendment protecting the definition of marriage uh, in our state from lobbyists and legislators who are determined to change it. I think it. the journey has been long. It's been um, hard fought. Minnesotans spoke so loudly during this last election with you know, refusing to adopt that proposed constitutional amendment. It was a very clear statement, and I think we're now ready to take the next step, and it means everything to our families. It means everything in terms of the kinds of responsibilities and accountabilities and rights that we will be able to exercise. There's lots of reasons to believe that Minnesota's public is not ready for same-sex marriage, and nor are they ready for the legislature to take it upon themselves to change um, it. This, this bill because it only allows uh, a joyous occasion to occur in the lives of so many of the people that we know, won't impact anyone's faith tradition, anyone's closely held personal or religious beliefs. In fact, and although I'm not here to go through a chapter and verse, line by line recitation of the bill, you'll see that this bill has very strong, very aggressive, <coughs> and to many people very important and comforting religious protections so that communities of conscience, uh, and others in Minnesota who uh, may disagree with, uh, with this bill won't be compelled to do anything, won't be required to violate their own consciences. This is a live and let live proposal. In 2013, because of the courage of a few, the Minnesota legislature has the chance to finally right this wrong. Our elected officials have the chance to ensure that all families are valued and treated equally in Minnesota. That begins with passing the legislation introduced today. Change. Once you open the door, you're not going to be able to shut it. I personally will go to jail before I ever perform a marriage to a homosexual. We are so honored to be here today and so proud of the Minnesotans who have come together to bring marriage for families like ours to our great state. Together we've shared in joys and supported each other in sorrows. We lived in New York City during 9-11. We grieved and mourned the loss of my father two years ago. And we've shared our three best days, the births of our children. Our children know we'll always be a family, no matter what. But we all dream of the permanence that comes from the knowledge that our neighbors and our community 
and our state will always treat us as a family. That comes from marriage and there's no substitute. Unfortunately, we know that there's at least one more best day yet to come, the day we get married in Minnesota. When we're talking about gay marriage, we're not talking about an immutable characteristic like the color of your skin, okay? The human genome map was completed in 2003. There is no gay gene, okay? So the concept that you're born that way, and it's an immutable, con uh, immutable characteristic, is an unscientific lie. Uh, my anecdotal, uh, anecdotal experiences in the clinic are unequivocally echoed in the myriad studies that continue to come out from after more than 25 years of research. The children raised in same-sex uh, couples by same-sex uh, gender parents fare equally well in all areas of emotional, psychosocial, and behavioral adjustment as opposite gendered parents. It's clear that children's optimal development is influenced more by the nature of their relationships rather than the particular form that it takes. <laughs> uh, last year, the uh, board of the uh, Minnesota chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics <laughs> <laughs> uh, bravely, unanimously uh, voted to uphold, <laughs> uphold the right uh, of all children and all families to the legal, financial, and psychosocial security that comes from having legally recognized recognize parents who are committed to each other and to the welfare of their children. <laughs> Security obviously comes through love and commitment, not from sexual orientation. The rights, benefits, and privileges that come from a legally recognized marriage cannot be obtained by any other means. All families benefit from the reassurance that comes from knowing that your family is safe and secure. Extending the freedom to marry to all loving and committed couples is in the best interest of all children and families like ours and thousands of others throughout the state. The rights, benefits, and protections for all people will continue to strengthen every family, families like ours. I'm done. I think basic rights should be available to all, uh, but marriage is uniquely between a man and a woman, and we should not redefine it. Um, I don't know if we have the votes no, uh, right now. Um, I think we're close, but it's going to be a, a lot of hard work. Um, and so my message today at this press conference is um, for folks uh, to engage. Um, that's what we have the legislative process for, so that folks can be in communication and relationship and contact with their elected representatives. That's what we have the committee hearing process for. Um, you know, I think we're close. I don't know if we're there. Uh, and. Um, and again, I can't answer your second question because I just don't have the nose count, but I do know that this is not a partisan issue, that this is an issue that is shared broadly uh, because the values that this speaks to are the values that unite us, and they're much, much more important than those values that divide us. The end result will depend entirely on DFL votes in rural Minnesota. Even though I'm only 11 years old, <clears throat> I know that everyone deserves to have a mom and a dad. If you change the law that says two moms or two dads could get married, it would take away something very important for children like me across the state. My mom is very important to me because she teaches me about things about being a girl. Since every child needs a mom and a dad to be born, I don't think we can change that children need a mom and a dad. I believe God made it that way. I know some disagree, but I want to ask you this question. Which parent do I not need, my mom or my dad? We come today to you as a family with dreams. Dreams that one day soon, Minnesota will be a state that grants our son Jacob the freedom to marry. We want for Jacob what has been so precious to us for 40 years. We want Jacob to have the joy of a wedding, the firm foundation a marriage brings to families, and the societal support that comes with all marriage. Over the past few years, I've stood by the side of each of my three siblings as they married the ones they love. The locations of their nuptials were scenic and special. My eldest brother, Ben, on the sands of a beach in San Diego. My other brother, Josh, in the quaint backyard of the St. Paul College Club. And my sister, Britta, on the beautiful Mississippi River at the Nicollet Island Pavilion. 
During each ceremony, I wiped away tears as my siblings exchanged vows and forged new families with their beloved. And after each ceremony, I took pen to paper and signed marriage licenses for each couple. By doing so, I made official in the eyes of the government what was already official in the hearts of the newlyweds. As a gay man, I should have the same opportunity to marry as my three siblings. My desire to love is no less valid and no less worthy of recognition by our state than theirs. My ability to enjoy the rights and responsibility of marriage is in your hands, and I hope you'll treat me as you would treat my siblings, or your siblings, or your children, or yourself. I'm Lynn Osterman from New Hope, and I thank you sincerely for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. When I was a sophomore in college, I set the goal to serve in the Minnesota House of Representatives. And when I got here thinking I was going to be a thoughtful citizen legislator, I was ill-prepared for the partisanship that greeted my class, the chair's class of 2002. I served as a Republican because of my interest in smaller government. And it was incredibly counterintuitive to me to then, upon my arrival, tell citizens how the government wanted them to live their lives. I didn't come to St. Paul to single out same-sex couples and their families, but in my only term as a member, I cast a politically expedient vote in favor of DOMA, and I have regretted that every ever since. It was not my conscience or my own compass. Voting no today, this session, might seem politically expedient. But I can tell you from experience that you will have to live knowing that a no vote is not fair, it's not respectful, and it's not equal. I blew my vote. And I'm imploring you, please get this right. Minnesota citizens just want you to lead. What a look at this bill reveals that something much more insidious is underway here. For the bill would not just authorize any two persons to marry, as its title suggests. In fact, it would strip the words mother and father of meaning under Minnesota law. Henceforth, the bill states these two words among the most beloved and culturally freighted in the English language must be construed in a neutral manner to refer to a person of either gender. Of course, mother and father aren't gender neutral words. That's a fiction. All Minnesotans, all of us in this room have a mother and a father, female and male respectively, whose sexual union brought us into being. It's because marriage has a vital public purpose. It binds fathers to mothers and to the children their sexual union creates. This is crucial to children's well-being and to society's future. Same-sex couples pay taxes, vote, serve in the military, take care of their kids and their elders, and run businesses in Minnesota. We work hard and contribute to the same Minnesota system as everyone else. <coughs> Committed same-sex couples should be treated fairly under the law including the freedom to marry the person they love. Marriage is the only civil institution that ensures that every child is both legally and bio connected to their biological parents, their mother and their father. There is no child that has ever been born into this world that did not have a biological mother and a biological father. We need to maintain the current definition of marriage in order to protect that particular association because social science confirms what common sense and tradition have told us for generations and that is children do best when raised in the permanent committed relationship of both a mother and a father. My name is Dr. Karen Wills. I've been a licensed clinical child psychologist for 30 years with 15 at hospitals in Rochester, Minnesota and Minneapolis. It feels right to support HF 1054 today on Mental Health Day at the Capitol. Last year, Minnesota's psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, and marriage and family therapists reached a consensus. 
our professional ethics, our clinical wisdom as therapists, and our review of authoritative scientific research led state and national mental health associations to support marriage equality. Kids do better when parents communicate with love, respect, and reasonable rules, whether their household is headed by two men, two women, or one of each. And there is no evidence that children do best with one man and one woman as parents. The alternative being proposed, far from being value neutral, communicates and enshrines in our law a number of falsehoods, most particularly that gender is irrelevant or merely a social construct, an identity that we can put on or take off like a pair of jeans, that human nature is plastic and that men and women are essentially interchangeable parts. When I met Mary Ann in 1980, I knew she was the one. There was no doubt in my mind that she was the person I was meant to spend the rest of my life with. We shared the same traditional ideas, that marriage was about love, caring, and commitment to one person for life. Without the legal ability to marry, we exchanged rings and committed privately to each other. When we travel, we carry our marriage certificate, our living wills, and our power of attorney forms. As we go older, we worry about what will happen if one of us is hospitalized. Will we be able to see each other or make important medical decisions? Marriage is important. It provides stability in our communities. It sets an example of long-term faithful commitment, allows a couple to care for and protect each other and our families, and helps couples honor their commitment until death. Recognizing our marriage and allowing other couples like us to marry doesn't redefine marriage, it honors the tradition of marriage. It's now time to finish what we started. As a business owner, I must stress that Minnesota cannot afford to disadvantage itself in the workplace, particularly among the next generation of workers, those under 45 whom research shows are favor the freedom to marry two to one. We must aggressively retain our own brilliant young students and attract others to our state. These are essential to infusing our state with energy and innovation and leadership we need to continue to be competitive. And these young people, for the most part, are not attracted to discriminatory environments in which to live and work. Children need and deserve both a mom and a dad. To the male parents in this committee, if you vote for this legislation, this is a declaration that your wife plays no particular role in your kids' lives. And to the moms, a vote for this legislation indicates your husband is expendable. It is not homophobic to oppose same-sex marriage. Marriage is not about love, commitment, and responsibility. It's about kids, and we should tremble in fear at the notion of undoing it. Kelly and I are both attorneys, and we have cobbled together through contracts, second parent adoptions, medical directives, powers of attorney, as much protection as we can for our family. But it is not enough. It is not marriage. We still feel vulnerable. We don't know how well it will hold up if it's ever tested. And uh, the thing about same-sex marriage is that people who are married do have sex. And when same-sex uh, people are married, they do have sex, there's something called sodomy. Sodomy, defined in Minnesota, is sex by or with the mouth or, the, or through the anus. I urge you to vote against the changes inside this bill because it's going to put a health risk to the society at large, and it's going to put a financial burden on the people of Minnesota to be able to support all the diseases that will come out of this. Those who faithfully read scripture as saying that God recognizes and affirms all people regardless of sexual orientation are being discriminated against. To say nothing of our LGBT sisters and brothers who don't get the 515 benefits granted by law to married couples. I've been a pastor for over 23 years. I've officiated at dozens of weddings over my career. Most of them have been opposite sex marriages and some have been same sex marriages. And each time I preside at a wedding, gay or straight, I find that my love, uh, my marriage to my wife is strengthened and enhanced. Love begets love. I was here two years ago and I'm back to remind all those folks who are worried about the children of gay parents, we're doing fine, thank you. George and my dad have been together for over 30 years. They both had a hand in raising me. They taught me to watch out for others, to be kind. You'd be amazed to find out what gay dads can teach you about how to impress women. <laughs> they taught me that the most important thing is creating memories with the people you love. 
We'd see theater and ballet and play games. We'd go on vacations. Uh, we'd eat frog legs and snails and sharks and all the grody things that boys like. They invested their time and their love in us. They gave us everything that parents should. That's what I want from my boy Anderson. A whole belly full of happy memories with his family. You know, as a kid, I never knew that George was my family. Back then, nobody ever told me that. In society's eyes, when two people marry, a family is created. My dad and George couldn't marry, and so our family didn't count. Today, my son calls George granddad because we are family. I worry about the children in Minnesota who are wondering today if their family is a real family. If the government declares same-sex unions and opposite-sex unions constitute equally marriages under the law, the law will eventually punish and stigmatize those, those who stand by traditional marriage as the union of a man and a woman as discriminatory and irrational. This is why robust conscience protections are absolutely necessary. Without them, religious liberty becomes a casualty of same-sex marriage. I think it's important to recognize that this bill contains, depending on how you count them, no fewer than four specific provisions dealing with the protection of religious freedom. These have to do with solemnization of marriage, it's true. They also have to do with the protection of doctrine. Despite what you heard earlier, no one is required to renounce their religious beliefs in any way. Uh, they also deal with keeping in place the existing protection in Minnesota law under the Minnesota Human Rights Act. This is a very protective bill for religious freedom. What I really would like to address with you today is the inadequacy of civil unions. It's been thrown out um, as an option. In 1999, when Vermont passed the first civil union law, they saw it as a compromise and an opportunity to do what was, they thought, in everyone's best interests. Ten years later, Vermont moved to marriage for same-sex couples. States around the country are rapidly following suit. They have found that civil unions do not provide adequate protections for same-sex couples. They create confusion, um, and they create enormous problems for those couples. For example, when couples go into a hospital, um, they often are demanded to see documentation um, because doctors don't understand what rights couples in a civil union have. Um, when parents go to pick up their children from school, um, parents are often required uh, to submit their forms for a civil union uh, to show the school that they are indeed the parent of the child. Um, it is a confusing institution um, and one that has failed repeatedly. The state doesn't sanctify anything. We are government. We don't sanctify anything. That is the job of religious institutions. All we do here in the state of Minnesota is create a legal status. We give people a bundle of rights. And that bundle of rights is what we call civil marriage in this context. That's what we're talking about here, civil marriage. Um, I've been married quite a long time to my husband. We have a civil marriage that is recognized by the state of Minnesota. That is all we have. What religious aspect to that that we have is really none of the business of any of the people sitting around this table. One testifier said if I don't agree with same-sex marriage and that I must be a bully. That's bullying, she said. So I don't agree with it, so I'm a bully. So they're already name-calling? I have a problem with that. I can't tell you how many letters I've gotten that said, you're a bigot, or tweets, you're a bigot because you disagree. Really? Really, I'm, I'm trying to be a nice guy, but I have a different opinion. And so now you're labeling me, name calling me. Uh, institutions, including marriage, change when subordinated groups identify their oppression and resist it. And I am be, uh, proud to be among those, along with Representative Clark, though, among those that resist it. There are three basic types of policy bills that we pass in this place. Bills that forbid something, bills that require something, and then there's this happy middle ground which is a bill that simply allows something. It's not telling anyone what to do. It's not telling anyone what they can't do. It's simply tolerating, permitting, and allowing two people to do something that they desperately, desperately want to do, and in the grand scheme of things, is hurting no one. That's what this bill does. 
And I like to say that it's not just live and let live, it's live and let love. And that's what we ought to do. Um, members, I think that we have an obligation to lead on this issue. Minnesota needs to step up and lead. It is time we grant people the civil rights that they deserve. But this is the time, this is the year, this is the day. I hope that, I hope that people can vote yes on this bill. Thank you. Call taken. Senator Latz. Yes. Senator Hall. No. Senator Ortman. No. Senator Cohen. Yes. Senator Limmer. No. Senator Goodwin. Yes. Senator Sharon. Yes. Senator Dietzik. Yes. There being five yes votes and three no votes, the motion prevails. Sir, a roll call having been requested, the CLA will take the roll. <coughs> Chairman Lesh. Aye. Vice Chair Ellen. Yes. Representative Anderson. No. Representative Hillstrom. Aye. Representative Holberg. No. Representative Portman. Aye. Representative Howe. No. Representative Johnson. No. Representative Leaving. Yes. Representative Newberger. No. Representative Paymar. Aye. Representative Pugh. No. Representative Rosenthal. Yes. Representative Simon. Yes. Representative Scott. No. Representative Winkler. Yes. Representative DeRusso. Yes. Vote total being 10 to 7, motion passes. I thought that I was gay, cause I could draw My uncle was and I kept my room straight I told my mom, tears rushing down my face She's like, Ben, you've loved girls since before pre-K Tripping Yeah, I guess she had a point, didn't she? Bunch of stereotypes all in my head I remember doing the math, like, yeah I'm good at Little League A preconceived idea of what it all meant But those that like the same sex Have the characteristics The right-wing conservatives Think it's a decision And you can be cured With some treatment and religion Man-made rewiring of a predisposition Playing God Aw, oh, nah, here we go America the brave Still fears what we don't know And God loves all his children It's somehow forgotten But we paraphrase a book written 3,500 years ago I don't know And I can't change I would think hip-hop hates me Have you read the YouTube comments lately? Man, that's gay Gets dropped on the daily We become so numb to what we're saying A culture founded from oppression Yeah, we don't have acceptance for them Call each other faggots Behind the keys of a message board A word rooted in hate Yet our genre still ignores it Gay is synonymous with the lesser It's the same hate that's caused wars from religion Gender to skin color The complexion of your pigment The same fight that led people to walkouts and sit-ins It's human rights for everybody There is no difference Live on and be yourself When I was at church, they taught me something else If you preach hate at the service Those words aren't anointed That holy water that you soak in has been poisoned When everyone else is more comfortable remaining voiceless Rather than fighting for humans that have had their rights stolen 
I might not be the same, but that's not important. No freedom till we're equal. Damn right I support it. Press pause. Progress march on. With the veil over our eyes, we turn our back on the cause. Till the day that my uncles can be united by law. When kids aren't walking around the hallway, plagued by pain in their heart. A world so hateful, some would rather die than be who they are. And a certificate on paper isn't gonna solve it all. But it's a damn good place to start. No law is gonna change us. We have to change us. Whatever God you believe in, we come from the same one. Strip away the fear. Underneath it's all the same love. About time that we raised up. I can't Sex. Change.